Hi everyone, welcome back to the second part of the Vertigo video which discusses the auteur theory. And to run on from the theme of voyeurism, we also have something that Hitchcock was known for doing in terms of cinematography and editing, and that is his use of subjective camera work and eyeline matches. Subjective camera work being cinematography, eyeline matches being editing. And the subjective camera work and the eyeline matches is to basically cut to the shot of what Scotty is looking at, what he sees, and obviously gives us a chance to see what he sees. And what's interesting about subjective camera work is what it does is it puts the viewer in the body, if you like, or in the mind of the protagonist. And, you know, lots of filmmakers do this. It's not something that's unusual. But what is unusual is the amount that Hitchcock does it in his films. He obsessively always, you know, uses this repeat pattern of a character sees something, we cut to what they see, then we cut back to the character. And again, when we have that sequence with Scotty following Madeline around in San Francisco, there are an inordinate amount of shots where we cut to what Scotty sees. And it also, we see it at the start of the film where Scotty is hanging from the rooftop and when it cuts to that dolly zoom effect of that ground, of course, that again is subjective and it puts us in the, uh, the mind and in the character of Scotty. Now that in and of itself isn't unusual. Lots of films put you in the mind of their lead protagonist. What is unusual in uh, Vertigo and in Hitchcock's films is the amount that Hitchcock does it. So in the sequence where Scotty follows Madeline around, 30% of the shots are subjective. Okay, so that in and of itself, that's an excessively large amount of subjective uh, camera shots to include in the sequence. But what's also unusual about it is that Hitchcock is getting us to identify with very flawed anti-heroes, characters who aren't heroic uh, that we wouldn't really normally wish to identify with. And it's not just the use of subjective camera work that makes Scotty easy to identify with, it's also his blankness as a character. So in the scene where he meets Gavin Elster and he talks about catching up, the way that he explains himself as a character is through a lot of negatives. I guess that just about covers everything, doesn't it? I never married, I don't see much of the old college gang, I'm a retired detective and you're on the shipbuilding business. Or he's always saying things that he's not rather than things that, that, that he is. And because of that, it makes him a blank canvas and it makes it very easy for us as an audience to project ourselves onto Scotty. Now, normally our lead protagonists in films are heroic. They're brave. They're morally right. They do the right thing. They're good people. The characters in Hitchcock's films, his protagonists, usually have many, many flaws as people, namely their voyeurs, you know, they like to spy on people, might just be one of them. But even the villains in Hitchcock's films are very charismatic, they're quite likeable. And this again, I think, is part of Hitchcock's desire, his plan to get the audience to realise the dark sides of our own personalities and how we also might have aspects of our character which aren't perhaps that admirable or that heroic. And one of the reasons why this is interesting is that, you know, James Stewart has been cast in this role and James Stewart off screen persona was that of the everyman, very wholesome, you know, clean cut family man, a war hero. And Hitchcock liked to cast James Stewart because he said he was an everyman character. Um, but if Scotty in Vertigo is the everyman, then uh, we're in a lot of trouble. Scotty is a pretty questionable character throughout. So he starts off the film uh, as a fairly weak a uh, feminine, emasculated man. And again, this is a, a recurring character type in Hitchcock's films. His protagonists were often quite emasculated and referred to as impotent, powerless to do things. Again, if we look at Rear Window, you've got LB Jeffries who's in that uh, wheelchair. He can't do anything. He can't save Grace Kelly. And that's true of Scotty because of his acrophobia. So the policeman uh, falls to his death because of Scotty's acrophobia. Also Madeline as well, obviously later on in the film. So in that way, he's not a particularly heroic character. And at the start of the film, there's lots of reference to Scotty being quite feminized and emasculated. He mentions that he's wearing a corset at the start of the film, and that's traditionally an undergarment worn by women. And he actually says, you know, when I take this off, I'll be a free man. That's his darn corset, it binds. No three-way stretch? Very unchic. Yeah, you know those police department doctors, no sense of style. Well, anyway, tomorrow will be the day. Why, what's tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, the course it comes off tomorrow. I'll be able to scratch myself like anybody else tomorrow. I'll throw this miserable thing out the window. Be a free, a free man. 
Um, and then he's also seems to be very interested in the bra that Midge is making, which again alludes to his interest in perhaps feminine things. And even the way that he dresses Judy up, like Madeline, is quite similar to how a young girl might dress up a doll when she's playing. And the part of the film where he seems perhaps most feminine is where he has his breakdown after Madeline dies. And um, we know madness is a feminine trait in the film because we hear about the mad Carlota Valdez and also Madeline her, herself is considered to be mad because she's possessed by this spirit of Carlota Valdez. And when Scotty has his nervous breakdown and he's in the hospital, he's completely mute. Just like when we first meet Madeline, she says nothing. Scotty is now also saying nothing. And when he has that dream sequence just before the breakdown, we see him walk towards Carlotta Valdez's grave and he falls into the grave as if it's his. So there's a clear identification with the character of Carlotta Valdez and with Madeline Elster. So, you know, Scotty isn't really this alpha male, this heroic guy. And that, again, certainly ties into Hitchcock's personality, who himself didn't really fit that alpha male model. And so this kind of lack of masculinity, if you like, is often attributed to a metaphorical impotence or an actual impotence. And Hitchcock himself is reported to have often talked about his own sexual impotence. And this, again, is a very clear sign of a director's personality, autobiographical elements going up there on the screen. Later on in the film where Scotty does appear to become more assertive and more dominant, more masculine if you like, when he starts to sort of perhaps be a bit more controlling over Judy and tells her what to wear, etc, etc. Even then, it's not like he's a heroic man. This is when Scotty's probably at his most unlikable. Uh, the scene where Madeline <laughs> and says, you know, if I change, will that do it? Will that make you love me? And he says, yes. And she says, okay, I'll do it. He's very hard to like him in that moment. He's very sort of forceful and aggressive in the, the clothes shops and in the beauty salon before Judy's makeover. And then at the end of the film where he drags Judy up the tower and he's shaking her very aggressively. And it's hard to see this as a, a happy ending for Scotty because he's so unlikable at this stage of the film. The other character that we see many times in Hitchcock films is the Hitchcock blonde. And Hitchcock didn't like his blondes to be like the Marin and Munro's and the Jane Mansfields. Uh, he said that their sex was dripping off of them like baubles, Marilyn Monroe, people like that. It was too in your face. Um, Hitchcock preferred his blondes to be icy and cool uh, and quite demure. And I think for uh, Hitchcock, what he liked about these types of women were their mystery, the fact that they were quite mysterious. And this is very, very clear in the character of Madeline, played by Kim Novak in the film. She is the archetypal Hitchcock blonde, cool, icy, uh, but more importantly, mysterious. Her whole character is a mystery, a puzzle, which James Stewart character wants to solve. She talks in very kind of abstract, dreamlike ways. It's as though I, I were walking down a long, corridor that that once was mirrored and fragments of that mirror still hang there her costume is associated you know very often she has this washed out look to her costume and her hair she appears quite ghostly we get these green fog filters over her and this is very much part of Hitchcock's attraction to blondes and it's one more way in which that Scotty can be seen to be a cipher for Hitchcock in the, you know, just in the same way that Hitchcock is obsessed with blondes, Scotty is obsessed with blondes. And another way that they're quite similar is that Scotty obviously dresses Judy and tells her how to do her hair, how to wear her clothes and stuff like that. Hitchcock obviously did that as well with his leading ladies. Um, he had contracts with several actresses, Tippi Hedren, uh, one, Vera Miles, another, where he would be a puppet master, if you like, and telling them how to behave and you know what to wear and how to do their hair, etc. Just like me. Please, it can't matter to you. And this alludes to the reflexive nature of Vertigo and Hitchcock's films because Scotty, like Hitchcock, is directing his actress on what to say and what to wear and what to do. The other character in the film who is probably uh, more of a Hitchcock character in terms of directing their actress it would obviously be Elster. He made you over, didn't he? He made you over just like I made you over, only better. Not only the clothes and the hair, but the looks and the manner and the words. 
and those beautiful phony trances, and you jumped into the bay, didn't you? I bet you're a wonderful swimmer, aren't you? Aren't you? Aren't you? Yeah. And then what did he do? Did he train you? Did he rehearse you? Did he tell you exactly what to do, what to say? And a great example of this would be the scene where um, she is in Scotty's apartment. Scotty has undressed her and put her to bed. And Elster calls Scotty's apartment almost as if to say action and then Madeline wakes up and starts you know acting the part saying all the things that probably she's been been told to say by Elster and then at the end of the scene just before it's about to turn into this romantic moment between Scotty and Madeline he rings again as if to call cut or if, as if to say that's a wrap and she leaves the the apartment very shortly after so Elster and Hitchcock again have lots of things in common. Another thing that Hitchcock was known for including in his films was the theme of sexual taboo and we see this in films like Psycho with the incest taboo and in Vertigo the sexual taboo is to do with necrophilia and this is something Hitchcock himself spoke about in the interview with Francois Truffaut. The sex psychological side Le, is that you have a man creating a sex image, creant an image, une image de sex. that he can't go to bed with her Avec laquelle il ne peut pas coucher until he's got her back. Jusqu'à ce qu'il l'a de retour. So the thing he wants to go to bed with. À la chose qu'il avec laquelle il veut coucher. Or metaphorically indulged in a permis, form of necrophilia. Une forme de necrophilie. That's what it really was. In terms of mise-en-scene, a thing that Hitchcock was very well known for doing was including famous landmarks in his films, uh, Mount Rushmore in North by Northwest, Statue of Liberty in Saboteur, and in Vertigo we have the Golden Gate Bridge, which is um, a famous landmark in San Francisco. And why might Hitchcock have used landmarks? In Vertigo, I think it's to again much like the the god's eye view is to make the characters look small and dwarfed by their environments but also and this is i think very important for a film like vertigo is vertigo is a film which hovers between reality and dreams or reality in this kind of ghost world if you like and by including these famous landmarks it makes the less realistic elements of the film, it gives them a grounding in the real world so that when we see these very kind of strange things happen, we perhaps go along with it more than we would do if it was set in a completely fantastical world. And on the flip side of that, it makes the real world seem far more frightening and uh, uncanny, if you like, to see them used in these kind of very strange scenarios. And in terms of narrative, Hitchcock was known for doing a couple of things. And the first one was that he always liked to do what he called showing the bomb under the table. Four people are sitting around a table talking about baseball, whatever you like. Five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off, blows the people to smithereens. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information that in five minutes' time, that bomb will go off. Now the conversation about baseball becomes very vital because they're saying to you, don't be ridiculous, stop talking about baseball, there's a bomb under there. You've got the audience working. <laughs> and that creates suspense, hence why Hitchcock was called the master of suspense. And where do we see the bomb under the table in Vertigo? Well, that happens in the scene where Judy turns to the camera, breaking the fourth wall, and then we get that flashback. In that moment, we learn that Judy was Madeline all along. And then for the final 40 or so minutes of the film after that, all we're doing is waiting for that bomb to go off for Scotty to find out that Judy was Madeline and we are just in suspense wondering what's going to happen when Scotty finds that out. And this is another thing that Hitchcock was famous for doing, this bomb under the table, Judy's revelation, uh, is the narrative twist. He used that in his films quite a lot, not maybe to the extent of M. Night Shyamalan perhaps, but he did do it in a lot of his films. But what's unusual about the twist in Vertigo is when it happens. So in the novel that Vertigo is based on by Boileau, 
Ruffalo and Nasa Jack, they do the twist at the end of the film, but Hitchcock felt that that was kind of a bit of a waste because, as we know, he likes to show their bomb under the table. So apparently it was Hitchcock's suggestion to move that twist to much, much earlier in the film, about two thirds of the way through, so that we would get that suspense building up to the end. And for this last point, we're gonna kind of mix up the Saris's distinguishable personality with Peter Wallen, and we're gonna talk about a recur, you know, to go along with the, the Hitchcock cool blonde, uh, this recurring representation he had, and the narrative device of killing lots of these blonde women in his films, and he is quoted as saying that blondes make the best victims because their blood shows up like uh, footprints in virgin snow. One of the criticisms that's levelled at Hitchcock a lot is that he is a misogynist filmmaker and, you know, the auteur theory, as I alluded to in the other video, there is a, an air of misogyny to it in that it does seem to completely ignore lots of female filmmakers. And there are lots of uh, people who have criticised Hitchcock for the perceived misogyny in his films. Laura Mulvey's essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, talks about male gaze and how it objectifies women and she refers to Hitchcock films to back up that point. There's also an article online by Badisha on The Guardian's website where she talks about Hitchcock as a misogynist filmmaker. And we can see their point. There are lots of women who are constantly getting murdered in Hitchcock's films. The screaming woman is a recurring motif in many of Hitchcock's films. And in Vertigo, we see Madeleine Elster die, we see Judy die, and we also hear that Carlota Valdez dies. And she died. She died. How? By her own hand. <laughs> there are many such stories. Also, when we do have female characters, they're quite often duplicitous liars who are backstabbers or have something to hide. And in terms of duplicitous women, you know, Judy is obviously a very clear example of that. And, you know, many people would say this is Hitchcock's kind of sexism showing the idea that he's saying, no, these women, they can't be trusted. Um, and then he punishes them for that by killing them in quite gruesome ways. But not everyone agrees with that. Some people say that Hitchcock's films aren't misogynist, but they're rather about misogyny. And also, I would thoroughly recommend you read a book or at least a chapter on Vertigo by Tanya Modleski in her book, The Women Who Knew Too Much, where she points out that the women in Hitchcock's films, that what Hitchcock films actually do is explore the difficulty of conforming to gender roles. And we see women struggling with that in lots of Hitchcock's films, but also we see men struggling with that a lot in Hitchcock's films. So there is a scope for you to discuss that. And if you've got a question in the exam on representation of gender for component one, section A, Hitchcock is definitely an interesting director to talk about with regards to the way that he represents male characters and also female characters. And now we're gonna look at some arguments perhaps against the auteur theory in Vertigo. So we will look at this aspect in more depth in another video, but one of the things we need to think about is that films are not made in a vacuum, okay? So Hitchcock was alive and around in 1950 and Hitchcock was part of the Hollywood studio system in 1958. So all of the things that are happening socially, politically, culturally, historically, uh, all of the things that were part of the studio system at that time, they're also going to have an influence on the film besides just Hitchcock himself. And the other key one is Pauline Cowell's idea that uh, films are a collaborative process and there are many notable collaborators on Vertigo. I'm going to name a couple of them now. So the first one is going to be Bernard Herrmann, who is the composer of the score for Vertigo. And Bernard Herrmann certainly felt that his contribution to the film has a huge influence on it. He was quoted as saying that Hitchcock does 60% of the film, I do the other 40%. And when we think about many of the famous scenes from Vertigo and we refer to Hitchcock's love of pure cinema telling the story through visual methods, what we have to remember is that the whole sequence where Scotty follows Madeline around San Francisco, um, yes, there is visual storytelling going on there, but that whole part is accompanied by Bernard Herrmann's score and that is telling us how Scotty is feeling and it has a huge impact on the film. And Bernard Herrmann was an you know, incredibly famous film composer, he is an incredibly famous film composer. In fact, he did the score for Citizen Kane as well uh, and they occupy the first two places on Sight and Sound's greatest films ever poll. And part of that is due to Bernard Herrmann. It's not just to do with Alfred Hitchcock and Orson Welles, the directors, it's to do with a magnificent score on both of those films. Another significant contribution to the film is Edith Head and she was the costume designer on the film. 
And when we think about some of the most powerful moments of Vertigo, and particularly with Kim Novak's character, it's to do with costume. When we first hear in Ernie's in that green dress, she just pops on the screen. When we see her wearing that gray suit with her you know, blonde hair and a pale white skin, you know, she looks very, very ghost-like, and that's due to Edith Head. Um, one of my personal favorite bits of the costume in the film is the scene where they're kissing by the ocean, and we see Kim Novak wears this black chiffon scarf, and that is a perfect symbol or signifier fire for this mysterious unknowable character that she is because it's always moving around it never stays still much like Madeline does she's always running off running away from Scotty and it's got that see-through ghostly like feel and it's just little touches like that that Edith Head brings to the film and again is evidence that it's not all about Hitchcock. A third contribution to the film would be Saul Bass's incredible credit sequence we mentioned you know voyeurism as a key motif of Hitchcock's work and Saul Bass includes that straight away in his credit sequence where we see the shot of the eye and the spiral that comes out of it and this idea of obsession and falling for Madeline. And you know, Saul Bass also did the poster for Vertigo. And that credit sequence is almost like a short film in and of itself. There are so many themes that are touched upon in that film, voyeurism, the spirals, which emblematic of Scotty's obsession and his fear of falling. So Saul Bass, again, an incredible contribution. And lastly as well, while they were Narsajak, the people that wrote the book that Vertigo is based off of, Dantre L'Amour, and they had a track record of writing books that dealt with suspense, Les Diaboliques, which got turned into a film by Henri-Georges Clouseau, and in that we see a character coming back from the dead and a great deal of suspense about what's going to happen, and you know there are clear parallels there between that and Vertigo. But because of the auteur theory, we don't see Vertigo as being necessarily a Boileau and Narsajak film, or an Edith Head film, or a Bernard Herman film. We see it as an Alfred Hitchcock film. And Pauline Cale would say that's one of the main problems with the auteur theory. So that will be it today for the Vertigo video. The next video I do will be on another aspect of component one, section A. Thank you.